In last year's episode four, I covered holiday horror, and I talked at length about one of my favorite holiday horror films, Santa's Sleigh. I could not let this holiday season go by without bringing it up again and giving you guys a special little treat. Enjoy! You'll never believe who I have here with me. I have the writer and director of one of my all-time favorite holiday movies, Santa's Sleigh. I've got David Steinman right here. Hello, David. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Hi. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I'm super excited to be here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the Santa Slay love. <laughs> I am just so beside myself that I was able to track you down. And on such short notice, you granted me an interview the week of Christmas. So thank you. <laughs> so going back to Santa Slay. How, what, where, when, why? I want to know how... What was this a story that you had long been in development had that you had been thinking about since you were a kid? This story actually was something that my father's father handed down to him and then told me. No, I'm just kidding. No, I was um <laughs> you had me go. Uh, this is true. No, uh it's kind of it's kind of I don't know, crazy how it all came up. Uh I was I was working on Rush Hour 2 and I was watching Jackie Chan uh, block out a fight scene. And so we were on a boat in Hong Kong Harbor in the middle of the night. And my job was just to stay out of the way because the space was so tight. And so I was kind of on this top deck just watching him kind of block out this scene. And just Jackie Chan style... He never has a weapon, really. He just makes use of whatever's around him. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool if a bad guy did that? You know, just something like, you know, maybe a Jason, Freddy type thing. And then at the same time, I was playing around with this idea of, man, if you flip these two letters around, Satan goes to Santa. <laughs> and so my caveman epiphany was, let me merge these two things together. And I just started to write out just the opening scene. And I didn't really know what to do with that, but I really started that whole opening scene. And my thought was, well, this would be a great film. And like in the style of Scream, if we could just pack it full of cameos, because then you don't know where this thing's going to go and it'll grab people's attention. And so that's kind of how it all started, um, where I just wrote this one scene out. It was all handwritten too. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, and so I showed a few people, they laughed, they thought it was funny. I kept writing a little bit more. Um, but it was, it was, this whole thing was handwritten and, um, it was, I had pitched it to my boss. We were doing, uh, an international press junket and I had a captive audience on an airplane. And so I was just like, Hey, I just want to show you this thing. He's like, Ugh. so he starts reading. He's like, okay, this, is, this isn't bad. And then that was it. And then maybe it was like six, eight months later, it was in the summer and I got a phone call. He was at a party with Roger Corman and mm -hmm, yeah, that Roger Corman. <laughs> and so he's like, Hey, David, Roger loves your idea of a movie. And so he put me on the phone with him and Roger's like, I love the title of this. He's like, do you want to direct it? And I'd never thought about directing at that, like that moment. And then I was like, I'll never get this chance probably again. And so I'll always jump in on something just, so I said, sure. And so that's kind of how it all started. And then I had met, you know, we set up a meeting, we got to meet Roger Corman and he shared so much wisdom, right? Like, I mean, I'm talking like he's done more than any film school for a director. Right. right. All the people's careers he's launched and how, you know, the, this was the best working experience and internship you could ever get trial by fire. Right. And so Roger kind of gave me his marketing overview is he's like, I'll come up with a title and see how people respond. And if people respond, I'll make a one sheet. And if, you know, if the one sheet gets a response, I'll make the film. And so, right. So, okay. We had the title. And then I started to work uh, with people that I knew that could create a one sheet. And kind of simultaneously, uh, I had a really good buddy who was a, a PA that I'd met on a couple films and we'd worked together. And he was really into wrestling. 
<laughs> and so he had, he had um, said, Hey, I've got, you know, do you want to go to, it was like, um, I don't know, Monday Night Raw or SummerSlam or not SummerSlam, but I think it was Monday Night Raw. And it was happened to be in LA. And he's like, I got backstage access. So like, I'll go anywhere if you've got backstage access, right? Because it's just like, it's you a just whole get to see world. so much more. You get to experience it and you appreciate it. So we actually got to go in from the, where they make the deliveries into the stadium, like that down ramp where usually buses come out of or semis load in. We go in there and I, w- I grew up a big wrestling fan. And so the first thing I see is the nature boy, Ric Flair. And I'm like, what? And he's shaving his chest with this really cheap pink, like disposable razor. And there's some people oiling him up behind him. And I'm looking around and it's the circus. It is like, whoa, right? I'm just blown away by everything I'm seeing. My head's spinning. Bad guys are friends with good guys. And they're all talking and hanging out and watching what's going on in the front of the house and, you know, all this and that. And so my buddy had kind of known Goldberg. And we went out into the arena and had like front row seats. And all of a sudden, I didn't really know Goldberg because I had taken a little bit of a break from wrestling. Like, you know, (laughs) I hadn't been that ingrained in the wrestling culture. I'd left for a decade or so. (laughs) And when Goldberg entered the arena and everybody was going, Goldberg, Goldberg. And I'm looking and in my head before, Santa to me was like, I mean, not that they would do it, but like a James Gandolfini type or um, Ro- Robbie Coltrane, like Hagrid, like somebody big and hulking. But then I saw Goldberg and I'm like, well, why couldn't Santa be like just super muscular and, you know, like just a beast? And I started to think, well, I wonder if we could do that. So then I watched Goldberg and I watched the people react. And we went backstage and we met Goldberg and he's like, he invited us to dinner. And this was the wackiest dinner because it was with Mr. Belding from uh, Saved by the Bell, which is like, and then um, David Arquette <laughs> and oh, us. And we're all at the restaurant together. And I'm just kind of taking it in. But then I, I was like, hey, I hate to be this guy. <laughs> I hate to be the Mr. Hollywood guy. I've got a script for you. <laughs> and so, so I just, he's like, yeah, what's about? And I told him. And so his basic takeaway was, so I'm Jewish and I get to play a murdering Santa Claus, he goes, I'm in. <laughs> and so we made the one sheet. I show, I actually, uh, I, I, my same buddy got me on the set of like Spider-Man 2. I think he was like, had a bit part in there. And I, he was there. And so I gave him the one sheet. And he was like, yeah, just send the contract over, whatever. And so we had somebody attached who was, you know, a wrestling champ. Absolutely. Um, Roger Corman's kind of uh, interest was helped to launch it off the ground. Um, after that, Lionsgate said, oh, we're interested. You know, we, we would be interested in financing or distributing. And then at the same time, another company said, well, why don't we finance it? And then you can figure out who can distribute it after. If Lionsgate's interested, maybe they'll be interested later in distribution. And so this company had just gotten done. They had released Monster. Oh. And so, so I knew Patty Jenkins from before. <laughs> and so I kind of talked to Patty a little. And she's like, yeah, this is, you know, it's a great opportunity in this. And then, <laughs> so this is the company that did it. And then one of the first people that hired me in film also had a film going with the same company. And I think it was called The Upside of Anger. But he was in the office next to me there. And it was just like, it was kind of all crazy full circle. And so, yeah. And so that's how, <laughs> that's how it all launched off the ground. So how much time between your first hand writing it out, meeting Roger Corman, having a dinner with uh, Mr. Belding and <laughs> Goldberg to getting funding, how much time had elapsed? I don't, I don't remember, but it was probably, uh, I mean, it was somewhere between six months and a year. Because nothing's fast, right? Like you have to figure out, okay, now that you have this, I, I had to like, it was handwritten. I had to type it out, right? And <laughs> and the story, the story wasn't even fully baked as you know, like, well, like it still isn't. No, I get it. But um, 
And then it was all the other things because then it's like, okay, now you've got to make sure the financing, you've got to find the location. Does that location have in, like incentives because it's really low budget? And so like, I know for a while it was like, they were trying to send us to Eastern Europe. And I'm oh. like, man, we can't go like, like, I think it was Romania. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this is not a Romanian film, you know? It, it was too costly to shoot in the US. And so I was able to negotiate like for Canada. And then we shot up in Edmonton. And Edmonton was amazing because they have a super talented crew there, like beyond talented. And they, and the stages that we shot, this was kind of all, I don't know, it just felt right. The stages where we shot were where they had SCTV. Really? So, and I'm a huge, Second City TV, like SNL, SCTV. And so you'll kind of see that, like Dave Thomas is in there yes. from SCTV, right? And then Chris Kattan and SNL. And um, I mean, to me, it was just like being a part of history. Now, that wasn't the original location of SCTV. It was after, but it was still like, whoa. And just being in Edmonton was crazy. So, And then I got to shoot the opening scene in LA. The opening scene just punches you in the face. Like there's no... I, anytime I start to describe it, I'm like, I'm not spoiling anything. This is, all happens within the first, like, three and a half minutes. Did you want to open the movie with a bang like that? Yeah, it was like, so that had challenges, right? I mean, this is a first-time director, and so there's a lot of things, like working with animals, like, <laughs> um, had that. That was crazy. Working with ice or water, we had that. That kind of sucked children, like all these different components. And now you've got all these personalities for, for the very first, you know, scene to kick it off. And it's pretty complex. Like dinner scenes are already hard enough, you know, just with coverage and making sure that it makes sense. And then you inject action and need to make sure that you get coverage. And we had a very, really short time to do it. And it keeps going and, 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 and Goldberg's not even in that scene because he had, he had, that was the night, but a lot of stuff was happening leading up to this. The night before, uh, Goldberg had some sort of reaction where I think he had wrestled on the weekend and got an infection and had to go to the hospital, or like an emergency thing because his he had gotten some infection and they're like, whoa, you need to come in ASAP. So I didn't have him for that scene. And so I had to find a body double, which is impossible for somebody like Goldberg. And if you slow it down, in that action, when you see like some of the folks in there, you can, if you go really frame by frame, it's not Goldberg. And then because of that, I had to go back and then integrate Bill into the scene, which is like also, you know, to come up with that, like it was, there was a lot of curveballs. Lawless execution, because I have watched Santa Slay several times. Never once have I picked up on that. So well, well done. That and also, I had an amazing crew. Like these were folks that I got to work with in LA and knew and were just doing me favors too. So like they were there, they were lending their time and they weren't gonna, they wanted to help me put the like our best foot forward. And so like I owe anything to everybody that helped out. Um, but then it was like to, to construct the people around the table Rebecca, I knew because that was my boss's old girlfriend. And so we had a good relationship and I, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, if I were a film, sure. Okay. Whatever. And then it was finally like it happened. And I'm like, Rebecca, I need you. So she was like, cool. I'm in. And she was friends with Chris. So she helped wrangle Chris. Um, which by the way, just even seeing at the craft service table, I just remember like, I, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe Chris Kattan is here. And then at the craft service table, there's an apple. <laughs> you know, it's like everybody's like, ah, oh, okay, newbie, I got it, right? So, But you're like, so yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. Or just to have Fran do her laugh. Santa? <laughs> and then Fran, right? Like, I can't, like, I'm blown away now thinking, this is the president of SAG. And just <laughs> what she just led everybody through. And she was, she was so awesome and friendly and kind and nice and beautiful and all that, even in her bald wig with hair, you know, just like she was just so cool, you know, um, James Conn. <laughs> so I, he kind of like got roped into it a little bit. Uh, it was like a favor. And then I just remember it was 
two nights before. It could have even been the same night Goldberg. I was just like, what else is going to happen tonight, right? And I just had to rush over to his house. And he's like, I don't know, man. He's like, for a kid's film, there's a lot of swearing in this. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I don't think he read this. And he's like, I can't do this. And I'm like, oh, you have to at this point. And I just basically, I might have even cried. I don't even if I wasn't, I wasn't crying inside. There's no, be a ninja. no shame in that. If you get the final mm. shot, then it's worth it. <laughs> and so he's like, okay. But uh, he was shooting Las Vegas, the TV show at the time. And uh, he's like, all right, but I'm going to, I, I got to, I can't give you a whole day. I can give you one day. And then he ended up, he ended up coming in late because he got delayed. So I think I had like five or six hours and I had to shoot him first. So, which means I had to re kind of block everything else out. And so it was just like, so I think Rebecca and Chris came back when I had to shoot uh, Goldberg and integrate him into the scene. But everybody else was just like over the shoulder body double stuff. Like I was saying, there's so much care, love, and detail put into Santa Slay down to uh, the book, the the Rankin Bass scene. Walk me through how that was executed. How did you get puppet- puppeteers to do stop motion animation? Because that, that the first time I saw it, I think I was screaming. That like blew my mind. I was so happy. So, how do you give? exposition and backstory where it's just uh, like okay <laughs> especially in a film like that so I wanted it to be entertaining I wanted it to kind of keep your attention and everything I try to incorporate as much as my things that I liked about Christmas as possible and growing up like you look forward to that time of year because you knew Rankin Bass would be on there Frosty the Snowman would be on TV and you know and every like I loved you know Yukon Cornelius and and, you know, um, Burl Ives the, as the snowman. Well, now let me tell you about Rudolph. And all that. So I wanted that feeling. And I thought this would be a good way to kind of tell the backstory. Um, and then to inject some of the things that I couldn't. I didn't have the budget for, like, some of those things. So, like, how do we bring in an army of trolls or, you know, elves or whatnot? So um, we could do that in stop motion. Now, again, Edmonton super talented creative community they had these guys that could do stop motion they were doing everything analog like uh full-on construction set making the miniatures the little armatures and all that stuff and would shoot meticulously now here's (laughs) again another thing there was a camera jitter and so when we looked at the footage because you know it takes so long to do everything was shaking and it was almost unusable so if you look at like the parts where Santa gets angry that was actually the camera jitter that we we ended up using and we had to go back and reshoot it and that oh. took forever where it was getting behind like come on guys like you know like and you can't rush that it's meticulous um and so we had to recreate that so even though it's like just a couple minutes on screen that's a couple days worth of of doing if not weeks really and i, I don't want to underplay that and then you mentioned the book of claws and that's <laughs> funny or not because we had a prop trailer which caught on fire and that was in there and so i have the the original book and we actually used the one that was in the fire and so it added to its authenticity because it's some of its charred on the edge and when you have that book it smells a little still crispy like it's the so, hope i mean Whatever, you know, it was total Murphy's law in this thing. <laughs> but it all it all ended up working so well together and just the attention to detail, you've got the branding of of you know Goldberg's face as Santa just on everything, on the sleigh, on his belt buckle. It's just it's so lovingly done. So in terms of difficult scenes to shoot, I mean, you were working with an absolutely enormous bison. And I have watched every single special feature that is on the DVD uh, more than once. I'm not ashamed. to <laughs> I love it. But in the in the behind the scenes where they show the bison just hoisted up in the air. Can you walk us through what that was like? Because that must have been absolutely nerve wracking. So that's the one still image that I kind of keep close by because when I took a step, like a step back and I'm like, holy 
blank. Like, <laughs> I can't believe what we're doing right now. And then it was like, this is the magic of movie making, right? <laughs> so you've got a bison that we painted white an outfit with different kind of saddlery and, and armory, that kind of thing. We've got them hoisted probably 15 feet in the air. We had a very short time. I want to say that they gave us like 10, no more than 25 seconds because of the weight of the harness and the bison. We didn't want to, you know, I mean, it's already probably a little disconcerting if you're a bison anyway. <laughs> um, and then you've got the sleigh up there, giant blue screen. And now I'm trying to convince our DP, you know, our cinematographer and camera person to like, they're up on a crane and I'm like, Oh, just go under it. Just go under it. Cause we need to give the illusion of flying and then pull back. And he's like, I'm not going under there anymore than I need to. And he didn't even have his cameraman do it. The DP did it himself. And, and DP, we were again, lucky to have everybody. This was like one of the best, best cinematographers in Matthew Leonetti. And um, just to like, just to see how far people were willing to push themselves. And we had two bison, but that one that did that, it was, yeah, it was crazy to look at this image and to see it happen. One of the bison, I don't remember if it was Ronnie or Apache, was really like scared by Bill's voice. Like, cause Bill would be, you know, coming out, oh, you know, whatever. And that thing would take off. And then you'd see, <laughs> and you're like, oh, should we keep rolling? No, nope, got cut. Cause then you start to see the crew chasing after it. And so. <laughs> But it's daunting, like, all, you know, trying to corral a bison. Whatever a bison wants to do, the bison will do. <laughs> but Now, you mentioned Bill had a body double in the opening scene, but for the remainder of the movie, did he do all of his own stunts? That's incredible. Everything. Because he's Bill. <laughs> like, what you, what's a stunt person going to do that he hasn't, that can't, like, you know, throws himself off heights and flips and you know lands crazy and just has been through so much stuff I mean yeah he does such a great job and I can tell every time that I watch the movie how much fun not only Goldberg but how much fun everyone's having shooting it you guys must have had a blast <laughs> I think everybody had a blast but probably Robert Cole he was probably like what am I doing here like how did I end up here you know I'm getting like from I Spy to Santa Sleigh. But right. It was like, he, he's so off. good, though, as Grandpa. Turn yeah. the power off. You know, he was awesome. <laughs> but I, I'm imagining, like, I can't, not that it, they're the same, but I imagine it was probably similar to, like, what uh, Alec Guinness probably thought of the, like, Why am I in this star space film going on here originally until he was like, oh, you know, I don't know if, if we ever got to that, oh, part with, with Robert, but. <laughs> You know, I imagine it was probably a similar feeling like, look at this. I was an actor and now I'm. <laughs> How many uh, days were you in production? Oh, God, I can't remember, but it was probably around 20, 22, somewhere around that. Um, and then we had the additional day in L.A., which ended up being two days because of the, you know, um, the problem with Bill. But it was fast. It was fast. And. We had to lose, you know, action, even though it's a blip on the screen, it takes so much longer to film action than dialogue. And so we had to cut a couple action scenes because we were just running out of time. And so it's like, okay. So I was like writing at night, trying to make it, okay, how can we make this work? Cause we just lost this action scene. And so, okay, let's try and bump it up. Okay, so maybe it's gonna be more of a love story or something. <laughs> you know what people want <laughs> and yeah. as a first-time director the fact that you know you started out writing it then you find yourself thrown into the director's chair you must have been very attached during the filming process wanting to make sure that your vision was coming through was that difficult yeah. to juggle as a first-time director making sure that you were getting the shots that you wanted and the scenes that you wanted it's hard to let go because yeah. everything's so important to you and so I'm, I think this is the way I view it. Like when you come up with an idea, what, however you have it in your head and how it translates to this, to, you know, the computer screen or paper or whatever, you kind of lose a little bit. You can't recreate everything that is in your head to that. It loses something. And then when you hand it off to different people, it gets further and further away from maybe that vision that you had. 
right? Because people make it their own. They take a character, they do this or that, or maybe something's not in your head, like this, the setting, the scenery, a prop, whatever, that didn't come exactly how you had envisioned it. So you kind of lose some of that. But then you also get some bumps that are unexpected because you try and hire the best people you can. So an actor sometimes will elevate something even higher than what you thought or delivered a line better or come up with a line that's even better or your cinematographer does something different or the prop, you know, the, the prop folks make something even better than what you thought. And so you kind of go through this whole like push and pull of what it, it is. And so it's painful because uh, as somebody who writes and directs it, you want it to be perfect. You want everybody to love it. You want it to uh, be this. And Sometimes your visions realize, sometimes it's better than it is. And, you know, and, and you just know all the things that you wanted to go correct that might not have. And so you carry that. And so they often say that you never finish a project, you abandon it. And I get that now because a director without a deadline will probably work on it for almost ever. And so, you know, there's uh, a saying that you don't let an actor into the editing room because they're just focused on their performance only and they don't really care. And so it's hard to be a director in there and you just have to trust. You have to trust what your, your, the people that you really value and appreciate are around you to say, Hey, you know, you could totally live without this or this doesn't further the story or this is feels a little draggy. And so, you know, it was that learning experience. And so you don't want to learn on somebody's dime, but that in essence became film school. Sometimes you feel like George Costanza because it's like, you know, in the moment you wish, oh, what's the best line? What's this? Or what could we have done? And then when you're watching it later, you're like, oh, I should have said this. That would have been the perfect thing. Jerk store or whatever, you know? <laughs> Jerk store is the line. Jerk store. <laughs> and so like you feel that way. And I need to be reeled in sometimes because I could go too far into camp or too far into being corny or just something or, yeah, we don't need that extra dad joke. Right. And so it's just like, there, you have to have some parameters. So, you know, it can be a dangerous thing too. <laughs> I mean, I had, I had Santa walking into, this was Christmas day, hungry and what's open. The only thing left is, so when, you know, when you saw those Orthodox, the Jewish people, so that was, he was actually going to follow them in to the Chinese restaurant because that's the only thing, you know, open on Christmas day. Being Jewish, I know this. And so he goes, <laughs> he's not getting service. He gets a little uppity Santa like as he's trying to get a table. So now you've got the whole kitchen help confronting him Kung Fu style. <laughs> and it was a huge battle royale. <laughs> you know, that's when one of the things that we just had to cut out. But you know, that was like those things that was like, would push it more towards that crazy action gore. What I love are all of the puns, though, that are, in my opinion, perfectly peppered in and perfectly spaced apart, even down to the truck scene you were talking about, the back of the truck scene that is so, such a nod to Terminator 2, and he's Robert Patrick, and he's running after <laughs> It's just, it's so good. Even the ludicrous, move, bitch, get out the way. Move, bitch! Get out of you hit every check box on what a great movie is to me. And it's such a blast and it's such a treat to be able to share it every single time with someone who hasn't seen it. And that's that's what I do every year because I was working at Hollywood Video when this came out. And I, re I remember it very vividly on the shelf. I'm like, Santa Slay, what is that? <laughs> but see, okay, but you know, there's a tone thing, right? So you, what you held up, that DVD cover, I think that might set unrealistic expectations because if I see that, I'm getting a straight up slasher, gory film. And now I might not like, what is this? This is not <laughs> what I'm, you know, like, uh, you know, like, uh, thank you for not making us or Samoan or what, you know, it's just like, that's not what I expected. And so... <laughs> And so, like, the original artwork I thought was more on point, but they're like, oh, this isn't going to market. Because, you know, Lionsgate, everybody knows their, what they think is going to sell. And the original one was, like, a fire, like a, a bright, warm fireplace with Goldberg peeking out from underneath it. And so it looked like it might be a little bit funny and campy. And so I think that was, like, the tone 
you know, trying to mix genres. But that, to me, it was like, uh oh, we're going to alienate people who are looking for, you know, a slasher film. And that might be disappointing because there's either not enough gore or not enough nudity or not enough whatever. I mean, you checked it all. You had gore. You had an entire strip club scene, which should certainly... Uh, Check that box. Yes, that would wet any nudity palette. Um, I love the strip club scene so much. Gold diggers. I want a shirt. I want a gold digger shirt. Do you still have any? All right, gold diggers. Now, this is actually part of my my backstory. <laughs> um, my grandfather owned a strip club called really? gold diggers and that's why i put it in there and so um so i grew up so anyway, at a strip club about, you know, the gift and so the a lot of the the illusion is the veil of illusion is dropped to me like i like the magic yeah you know yeah so my you know my mom's rule was that when i was growing up that they had to have their tops on when i was near them because they would feed me quarters like all day and i would play pinball um, and my grandpa and I, we would, I mean, I remember we would drive around Saturday morning and chase down like the beer distributors and he would buy kegs off like their trucks, put it in his giant Lincoln, uh, trunk. And like, that's how, so everything was just like, it's a different world. And I want it was my thing. Like, I want to pay a little homage to, you know, my background a little and so Gold Diggers was his 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 club, his strip club in Detroit on Michigan Avenue. And um, yeah, it, it was uh, it was, so I, I mean, that was part of where I grew up. So that scene was tricky because <laughs> we can't pay enough. Like the pay that we would give extras or stunt workers isn't more than a stripper would work, <laughs> like that would make. Yeah. And so to try and convince some strippers that come because, you know, you can't have extras like take their tops off and, you know, that. And so they would say, okay, well, we'll come in during the day and we'll give you a few hours. And then they would like leave or it was just like, so it was making use of what's there. And so on the swing, it was actually a stunt person. Her name was Wanda. And because Bill kept working with her over and over on this stunt, magic happened. They got married. They've been married, I mean, at least probably now, maybe around almost approaching two decades, if not there. They have a son who's, you know, got to be 17, 18 years old. And I see on, you know, he's uh, he's going to be a, a beast of a football player because he's going to college now. And so Bill met his wife on Santa Slay. Santa Slay is responsible for Bill Goldberg's marriage. If his son ends up being a, you know, a monster in the NFL, <laughs> Santa Slay might have played just a tiny role, you know. You, you better get sent a jersey if that becomes the case. But the AV Club, I love their quote about it, that it might be one of the most wholesome slashers. <laughs> that it is, it has, that's what I love about this movie. It has heart. Like there, it just it has it has. I wish you were, I wish you were in the test audience and and maybe about three hundred other yous, and that would have <laughs> that would have been a different feeling. To, I mean, every person I've ever showed this uh, movie to, and I have a lot of movie parties here uh, with lots of people in attendance. They always love it. I've never heard someone say like, "Dude, come on!" Like it, <laughs> it is. Because I feel like it is also having a little bit of a renaissance. I always see people sharing clips on Instagram and such. When did you notice there was a uptick in Maybe a couple of days ago when I got an email from you? <laughs> I promise you, there are so many more people who absolutely love this movie. I love this movie so much. Oh my God. I love you for loving that movie. I but I I also recognize when someone's like, I'm writing it, I'm directing it because I, I know what on a much smaller scale yeah. what it feels like. And I um I your vision your vision came through and it came through in such a well done way. Something that I love about Santa Slay is stay with me here, relates to one of my favorite underappreciated horror movies, which is Jason X. Jim Isaac directed. Yeah. 
he has sadly since passed away. But that film, I always thought, one, had heart. Two, it was a movie that knew exactly what it was, but it was having fun with itself. And that's the feeling I get each time that I watch Santa Slay. And in my eyes, you're like the holiday version of Jim Isaac, who I hold in the highest regard. And I feel like it's so sad because Jason X is definitely having a renaissance. I feel like more people have warmed up to it and realized like, just like Santa Slay, Santa Slay looks like, in my eyes, a $20 million movie with a huge budget. <laughs> um, and you're laughing. I know you didn't have that kind of budget, but Jason X was in the same line. Like they, they did not have a huge budget on that, but it looks... It looks like it cost so much money and they made the most of what they had and pushed it as far as they could, just like with Santa Slay. Um, so Jason X is one of that's another favorite horror movie of mine. What is your what is David Steinman's favorite horror movie? The original Night of the Living Dead. Excellent answer. I mean, that I won't say I was a grown ass man, but I was close. <laughs> I was I just remember, like I was freshman year in my dorm and it was Halloween and they had like some kind of cable closed circuit thing in the dorms and it was on at night. And I just, I don't know why, like I know the dorm where I was, was near where they kept the cadavers. And I actually had difficulty sleeping that night. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, you know, and it was like that. And I just thought it was so well done because it's like black and white yet you know, sometimes in black and white, you don't feel like you're missing color. You actually feel like sometimes you see more. And just the dark ending. Uh, yeah. And then there were like social justice components in there. And and it's just the slow build and just getting confined and confined into smaller spaces. And that I tried to do just something like just squeeze them into the basement and that, but I wanted an out, you know. Um, but, you know, I would say Night of the Living Dead was probably that was probably i would say that one and maybe there's a, a zombie thing um oh god, god danny Boyle's. um oh uh 28 days later uh, yeah oh man like that was the next like one that was really like whoa game changer <laughs> just the, even the opening scene to wake up yeah in a hospital and the whole world is just so completely changed and you don't know what happened. And that was just like, whoa, you just got, you got thrust right into onto that ride and you didn't know where it was headed. And, you know, so I I would say those two are probably um, the ones that would really speak to me. I am a total Tom Savini lover, um, the special effects artist, and he did Dawn of the Dead. And that was, I loved Dawn of the Dead in high school that was probably my favorite my favorite movie when i was younger and um to your point about when a movie's in black and white you know like you said you don't always need to see the color tom savini always says it's what you don't see that scares you and you know he said it also affords him the ability to you know uh when he's doing a difficult shot you know if you cut away at the right moment it's what your mind fills in the blanks that makes it your imagination is worse or is is uh way more vivid than anything that anybody could put in front of you and so um you know hitchcock style right like you didn't see what happened in the shower you just saw the aftermath but that was scary enough right (laughs) and so and black and white yes hershey syrup going down the drain (laughs) What is the most meaningful takeaway that you had after you wrapped Santa Slay? What was the best part of filming it for you? The experience. I got to do something that a lot of people won't, can't, don't have the opportunity, you know, the privilege to do. Um, and it was, it was chaos in a great way. Like, you know, answering a thousand questions per hour and having to make those decisions and keeping a team moving forward, uh, coming up with something at the end, right? I mean, there was lots of lessons. And so I would say the experience and that that gives you confidence to do things. It doesn't necessarily, you know, mean uh, something in film, but just like I can lead a team, I can do 
uh, you know, I can come up with something creative. And so to see that what I wrote, um, somebody said, and it lives on in a way that I could see it, you know, it's just, there's something really crazy about something that you wrote and having somebody else, you know, act it out or say it or portray it. Um, like that, there's something gratifying about that. And I could see, you know, probably where, you know, a playwright or screenwriter gets that adrenaline to see their final product. You know, it's hard to say, oh, cool, I gave the world a killer Santa Claus, you know, <laughs> but I'm glad it's out there. Absolutely. So you obviously left the movie open for a sequel with the ending. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, you don't want to, you don't want to kill a good bad guy. You know, you have to leave the door open a little. Do you think that there's still time for that door to be fully open? Because I know a lot of people would want to see a sequel. What's the chance I'm going to make it right? Like I look, I am your biggest cheerleader right now. I believe you, we could get this done. I'll never say no. Uh, and, and, I don't know. Fans, what do you think? <laughs> Are you ready? Let's crowdsource this. We can totally fund this project. I, I believe in Santa Slay 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> a lot more breakdancing in this one. <laughs> we have a budget for cardboard. <laughs> David, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me right before the holidays to talk about one of the greatest horror movies to ever grace's planet santa's sleigh happy holidays to you and thank you so much for joining us on midnight rhino thank you it is a total pleasure <laughs> thank you thank you and have a happy holiday don't get killed i'll try not to because i got to get this episode out before at least that happens so <laughs> thank you all right take care Fuck. Thank you so much to David Steinman for sitting down with me to talk about his experience working on Santa's sleigh. Now, everyone, be sure to let myself and David know how much you would love to see Santa's sleigh, too. I hope you enjoyed this stocking stuffer episode of Midnight Rental. If you missed last year's holiday horror episode, be sure to search for episode four of Midnight Rental on YouTube now. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Who's next?